Welcome to Jacob's Pillow. Um, and welcome to this Pillow Talk. It is my honor and privilege to be here with Liz Lerman. My name is Jennifer Edwards. I'm a scholar in residence here for the week at Jacob's Pillow. And I will um, tell you just a little little brief introduction of, of Liz Lerman because we want to get right into the heart of it, yes? Um, so uh, Liz has a rich history here at Jacob's Pillow uh, that started in 1985. Uh, it spans uh, the last 30 plus years and uh, she's been presented in the Ted Sean and the Doris Duke Theater. Along with the summer stage, she's taught and led workshops um, at the school and uh, co-directed and co-led dance and social change convenings over the years with Willa jo uh, uh, Jolly Willa Jo Zoller of Urban Bushwomen. Uh, outside of the pillow, <laughs> for 35 years, uh, Liz led Liz Lerman Dance Exchange uh, in the D.C. Baltimore area and uh, most recently has become a professor at uh, Ace, uh, Arizona State Uni University, ASU. Uh, that began in 2016. Uh, I neglected to mention that she was the 2017 Pillow Award recipient. Uh, that was another piece of her Pillow history. Um, and has also won uh, MacArthur Genius Grant Fellowship um, and the United States Artist Ford Fellowship in Dance. I won't, I won't embarrass no, you too much I'm just very, more. very fortunate, so <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you. Um, and today we're celebrating two things, both the, um, her piece that hopefully a lot of you have seen or will see this evening, uh, Wicked Bodies, and also her fourth book, Critique as Creative, um, which we'll be talking a little bit about. And, and they're available right outside the door, and uh, Liz will be here to sign your books if you'd like. So, Wicked Bodies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I'd love to frame this talk kind of how one enters, how one bees, how one is, um, and how one exits a process, a community, um, because that's, that is quite, quite a lot of your work. Um, uh, so how did you enter this relationship with Wicked Bodies in uh, 2013? Um, well, first, can I say thank you all for coming and spending part of your time here with me. I know time is so precious for all of us. It's easier to spend time here at Jacob's Pillow than many, many places, <laughs> I can tell you. It is such a, such a beautiful place, and you can really feel the spirit. I have to say it's one of the things I like about being in Arizona. There are many things to not like about Arizona, but one thing to love about Arizona, if you're able to come out, is the feeling you get here, too. The spirit is very deep in the land there. Um, and as Jen just mentioned, 2013, like, that's a long time ago to then bring a piece to fruition uh, now. And there were many um, stops and starts in this particular work. I'll say that um, I happened to be t uh, teaching, actually, Critical Response Process, which is the subject of that book, in, in Scotland. And I decided to spend the afternoon at the Edinburgh Museum, which is a beautiful museum. Went in without any knowledge of what was going to be there. And it was an exhibit called Wicked Bodies. And it was 500 years of drawings of witches. And I went in not that interested in witches, interested in women, interested in older bodies, myself a good example of an aging body. And I'm not like, I mean, I've been thinking about things, but I wasn't that interested in that version of things. But boy, after like five rooms of it, most, <laughs> most of it I have to, it, it was mostly European, Northern European images of witches. The exhibit does not attempt to do a worldwide uh, st uh, examination of how witches are um, uh, documented everywhere, but um, mostly by men and mostly pretty, pretty awful. I mean, the pictures are, well, I joked when I came out, well, I was very upset, but when I came out, I thought, well, if I make a piece about this, it'll be the most pornographic thing I'll have ever done <laughs> because the witches are busy doing all kinds of terrible things with goats and stars and constantly, I mean, it's just awful. But it got me pretty interested. And so I began what, which is something I love to do and something I'm, I try to proselytize even at my institution of higher learning, that there are so many ways to engage with research, 
with knowledge building, with comprehension, with how we come to know things. And then it's going to be a long, it's going to take a while. Because, you know, we read, we read, we talk. Turns out when I go back to Arizona, I say to people, I'm thinking about doing stuff about witches. You know, someone will say to me, oh, yeah, my mom used to send me down the street to the lady to get a cleansing with the sticks. Like, it's a living thing for some people in some cultures. So um, the research began. And at that time, I was living in Baltimore, and Freddie Gray was murdered. And my city went up in a riot. And I, I didn't understand at that time any relationship between this research and that murder. Subsequently, I was able to understand that with the, the murder of George Floyd. And I could begin to see, actually, working on the witches is a good idea. If part of it is about the relationship of how the state thinks about bodies, how churches and synagogues and every, how, how the biggest, our biggest institutions think about bodies and what they decide to do about it. So with that in mind, able to dig back in again, and uh, then it was a matter of just, well, we won't get, I don't know if we'll get into it, but how you sustain dance making in the United States right now, if you're an independent artist like I am. So, but that was the start of it. So, um, you know, a lot of the, what I, what I have come to understand about this process uh, is that there were core questions that were, that were kind of driving this. Um, but then in reading this book, it's okay. Nope, don't need them. I'll get them. <laughs> I'll retrieve them if you need them. <laughs> that part is already done. <laughs> um, uh, in reading this book, uh, it's so apparent that there is such a rich process that has filtered through all of your work. Um, and, and so I did want to read some of the questions here because they're so relevant to what I've now learned about this current piece. Uh, this comes from an, an essay, so there's, there's writing about the process that goes into the process, and then there are essays uh, and kind of case studies of, of application of the process in the book. So this comes from a case study titled, Learning a City, Resisting Erasure. And we can talk about extinction and how eraser, eraser comes in there, too. Um, but these questions that um, evolved from this particular process uh, in the city of, da of Dallas, Texas, uh, some of the questions included, why do we learn lost or missing histories? How do we learn these histories? How do we teach or pass down these histories? And how do we carry history in our bodies? And to me, again, reading this book, I was like, oh, wow, this, this could have been written about this piece, although this was years and years ago in a very different process. So I did want to kind of bring up those questions and then uh, ask you to expound on, on how, how that has played out in this piece. Actually, what's interesting about this, this book has a contribution of, from 20 practitioners, and that's actually from uh, Paloma McGregor, who dances in this project, and Cassie Metter, who took over the dance exchange for me when I left the dance exchange. And uh, they did some work together in Dallas, and this is where that particular story emerges from. Um, I, I'm sure if we spent the rest of our time together telling stories about who raised you, and then who raised them, that we would know already among us what happens to our histories. That you would reach back, well, wait, my mother did used to behave. Who taught her that? Oh, yes. Was it my, oh, was it my grandfather who was living, well, in the Ukraine? Now, now what do I do about what's happening right now? It, it's, it's that, we, we all know that this happens. We also know that it's all incredibly personal like each and every human soul. <laughs> Turns out we did a piece about genetics and guess what, it's not just human in us. You know, we are here, but for the evolution of so many creatures before us who lived here for us, discovered things and passed that on th to us. So you'll see if you come to see the piece that one of the jobs that witches have is that they carry the movements of extinct creatures. Not, not, the, not their story, the movement. This was fantastic to go and investigate. 
So every every uh, artist in the company had to go find some extinct creatures and decide whose theirs was and then how they wanted to embody it. And uh, I myself will just tell you that I did a better job reading than looking because if I looked at the films, I I just it was too painful. So when I saw the actual creatures moving in in the world and knowing they're gone, I just, I couldn't personally do it. But when I read about it, there are all kinds of incredible stories. So, so that's part of it. Um, the erasure part is interesting. I mean, part of the erasure is, you know, how many of you delete stuff every day? I mean, there's only so much we can carry, right? And uh, I'll go back to my dance department right now. <clears throat> this dance department was, like most dance departments in the United States, focusing on ballet and modern dance. And um, that is not the group of young people who are arriving at our campus. Uh, we are uh, soon to be dominant. Uh, white people will not be dominant my, my, in my... I'm still trying not to use white non-white. I'm trying to figure out my own language about this, but the, the amazing number of Latinx and indigenous people in our communities is just beautiful and what in the histories they bring are incredible and what they want to study are really interesting. So what do we what do we do? Well, you know, we could make space. We could have one course on it and still keep teaching ballet and modern. <laughs> one course. And that's what usually happens. But if you're interested in aesthetic equity like I am, it turns out actually you have to change a lot of things. You have to change the floor, you have to change the schedule. You have to change the assumptions about when dance began. I had a beautiful young woman in my office who has on her resume, she started dancing at 18. I said, wait, I thought you danced with your mother in the kitchen. That's what you told me in class. We made a dance about it. She said, yeah, but where does that fit on my resume? <laughs> right? That's 15 years of dance erased from her resume. Well, what do we do about that? And some of it is how do we rename the categories? How do we change our resumes? What is it we decide we think is important? How do we, and that's part of this work. And that's why although we do it for the stage, and I often think the stage work is the engine, it drives all this, the actual meaning of it is carried out in multiple places, not just in the stage. It's the way each of the people in this piece behaves as they go out from our rehearsals. It's the way we built something together and how, how much more bold am I to understand how to talk about something. Well, Vincent Thomas is right over there who's in the piece. And because I've known Vincent for a long time, but the way you talk about your histories makes me bolder about how I can, in fact, uh, bring what I've learned from Vince, Vincent into the world. And I think that's true of our audiences as well. I think if you're willing to come and dwell with us for the hour 45 minutes that it is, I hope to think you're different and you feel, well, more able to contend with this very question. I'd love to talk about, um, well, two things. Maybe, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll put them side by side. Um, one is from a conversation you and I had, uh, Liz, about this coming together of thinking and feeling simultaneously. Yeah. Um, and then the second which you know might might seem like a, a, a diversion, but but we'll see, is um, a comment that was made by uh, Will Bond mm -hmm. uh, in the talk back uh, two nights ago, and that was about how, in the beginning of this work, in the beginning of this process, you facilitated the building of a container for anger, oh, yeah. mm. um, because there was so much kind of bubbling, right, for, 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 for everyone at that moment in time. And I don't think that that's gone away, necessarily. Um, so I do wonder how, how those things go together, right? Creating containers for feeling, um, creating a work that, um, that, that is, is a container for a lot. This is a deep, rich piece for those of you who are, <laughs> who are about to see it tonight. Um, so I, I wonder if we could talk about, about that. I mean, maybe I'll start by saying that um, in my early years of work, I would describe it as um, where could you get information and feeling at the same time? That we were expected to watch the news and it would be information, and then we were expected to read novels and we would be able to feel. And it seemed kind of an odd uh, dislocation to me. 
uh, since the speed with which I think thinking and feeling move in ourselves wasn't well served always by that. Because then the way we're trained to read novels and to listen to the news sets up this dichotomy for most of our life. And it seems, as I say, not, not, not helpful to me. So I was, have always been interested in trying to provoke within a dance piece the possibility that you could do both. I don't think you always can, and it's fine to live in one and the other. But I know, that, again, that we all know that uh, when you are experiencing, you know, when you, <laughs> if you happen to be listening to whatever news channel you listen to, you're gonna get, you get mad and something is happening in here, and you might even find yourself expressing it with, uh, I know, I know the person I live with does. <laughs> so, so if you saw, actually, one of the early pieces I did here was something I was working on, something called docu dances, and they were they were meant to be documentary dances about the time we were living in. I tended to use a lot of humor. And one was nine short dances about the defense budget and other military matters, and and I made the piece because I actually couldn't understand the defense budget. I just couldn't get it, and I figured, well, okay, if I make a dance about it, I will know something, and I did know something by the end. And one of the sections was something about the M1 tank, which, by the way, we still use. And the M1 tank uh, has an 18-foot blind spot in front of it, so the people driving the tank can't see. Now, at that time, we didn't have all the things we have now, like, you know, the GPS stuff, the way it's working now, but then, and anyway, I did, the way I did that is I, I, I put myself flat on the floor, you know, like chugging along, and I banged my head into the side of the stage so people could understand what it would be like if I was a tank and you couldn't see. It was funny. And afterwards, <laughs> afterwards, especially at universities, there was always a line of students, and they would always say to me, is that true? Is that true? And I just, I love the question. So, I'm looking for ways for people to be able to find themselves. And I would say in this piece, which as you say is layered, there's a, a lot of um, information in this piece that you get in a variety of ways. Um, but people also are emotional in this piece. Some of that comes from the music. Some of it comes from the way the dancers are moving. Some of it comes from, by the time Vincent has his solo, we're late in the piece and things have been accumulating, and maybe it's just something that he does that causes you to reach whatever point you will. But I don't want to say too much about it other than if, if you're coming, but, um, but that I just want to also add that for this piece, we made um, a zine that you can pick up at the store. We're experimenting with, like $5 for a zine is going to handle our economic woes, but let's just say we'll sell a lot of them. <laughs> but it, it, it's partly to share in the 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 non-linear nature of the research, and the non, actually the non-linear nature of what we're talking about right now, the relation of emotional to information, how those things zigzag. Um, I, th I know for people who, again, are trained in a particular, even, even you know, ballet dancers in my training, you know, class goes in a certain order, and if you go out of that order, it's hard, you know. But th I, I, I really think it's not random. You have the capacity to synthesize what's happening around you, and I hope that's what's going on. Uh, you talk in the book about a critical response process uh, as being a way to practice conversation. And in today's world, it seems like we need some practice <laughs> in talking to each other, um, civilly, maybe. Um, I wonder if, if we could talk a little bit about, um, because you also said in the talk back the other night, uh, the world needing embodied experiences and embodied practice. And to me, those things go together in some way. Um, I wonder, I wonder how so you... So I was, one of the things I love about Jacob's Pillow is the, it's an intergenerational environment. Um, you, and it's not just intergenerational in age, it's also intergenerational in a sense of what's, where are you in the arc of your career? So where are you, um, yeah, what, what, what is occupying your artistic and aesthetic drive? So I was able last week to teach the musical theater students. It's unlikely in my world that I would get to interact with them. And by the way, they would not have interacted with critical response. 
the theater students and the dance students around the country, by now it's settled down and generated. I'm surprised how many people know about it, actually. But they, not necessarily in there. In fact, it was a class of 22 students, and only two had ever heard of it. So I asked them at the beginning of class, I said, I want you to promise me something. We're going to try this today. You have to promise me that if you don't like it, you'll try it again one more time. <laughs> and you'll promise me if it's hard for you, you'll also try it one more time. I got all their promises. That was, that was good. <laughs> um, but then I said to them, um, OK, so um, you know, you start getting feedback when you're in the womb. I mean, it's it, way before we're born. People are telling us what to do, how to do it. Stop kicking. Don't do that. <laughs> you're making me sick. Uh, oh, you're going to be an astronaut. Oh, you're going to be this. You're going to be that. I mean, it, you know, it's endless, right? Before you're born. And then the second you are born, you start exerting your feedback. You know, you cry a lot, and they pat you. Or you cry harder, or they pat less. I don't know, but something goes on. Right? And then I said to the, the students, so how many classes, courses, or workshops have you taken where we get to think about how we talk about feedback? It starts before you're born. How many have you had? I mean, lawyers are trained to talk a certain way, maybe, and you take elocution classes, maybe, but it's not the same thing. How are we talking to each other about our judgments? How do we do that? And of course, dance is full of it. I mean, you know, again, your first little dance class, you go, and in our piece, actually, there's some references. It's, 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 not, it's nice to see. So um, that's where I think about the conversation piece, is I keep saying it doesn't have to be critical response. You all don't have to do that. But you need to think about something and put in place something so that there's some protections around. It's like neutrinos. The, you know, judgments fly at you like neutrinos. And if you're female, they're going to come in you a certain way. If you're a person of color, they're going to come in another way. If you come of a certain part of town, they're going to come in another way. And it might not be what the person's saying to you directly. It may be what you're saying to yourself because of what you've lived through. So that's where the idea of how we work, and this is, um, I mean, it comes out of, to me, it's ultimately incredibly creative. But it comes out of uh, practices in the art world that make sense to us, but can be of such big use in the rest of the world. And this is where I'm sad that art can be siloed into, say, a, a, an elite thing, or an unnecessary thing, or a luxury. Because of course, I don't see it like that at all, nor do I see our practices like that. And that brings me to the second part of your question, which is, you know, how do we feel about our bodies? And what, what's happening to our bodies, and why we can talk about people the way we get talked about right now. It's, it's really difficult right now uh, in our country and how we can um, bring back some respect. And certainly, uh, simple embodiment practices as much as if you, would you, touch me, as much as that. Even that, and of course the pandemic has terrified us, right? So then we gotta get through that too. I'd love to open it up to any thoughts or comments or questions that you all have. Um, while you're doing that, I just have to acknowledge Wendy Perrin over here. <laughs> Wendy, oh yeah, no, Wendy, Wendy and I, all right, well, there you go. <laughs> Wendy and I started Bennington College together. We were both 17. I didn't stay long, Wendy did, but we have remained incredible <laughs> friends and we provoke each other all the time. So I don't know what kind of questions, you get. but but she's been, she, you know, you have people in your life who help you think or they help you understand what you're doing or that anyway, Wendy's one of those people. So it's so nice to see you. Uh, the question is, how collaborative is the cre is uh, Liz's cre creative process? Oh, it's so collaborative. Some people would say I didn't make the work. <laughs> so <laughs> let's just let us be clear. Uh, yeah, you know, um, I wondered about this early on. I wasn't that good at telling people what to do. I mean, I try, you know, I in my early years, do it like this, do it like that, whatever, and. Uh, I wondered if, because I come up from through the 60s, that we were kind of anti-authoritarian, and that maybe we just didn't like the construct of that, was my, you know. Uh, and then also I noticed that um, when I was started, in, when I was choreographing, that the people, if they made something up, they were so much more committed to it than if I told them what to do. And they were often better inventors than I was. Not necessarily, better thinkers about witches, for example, because I was the one doing all the digging around. So that was one side of why it grew up. They, they were just better at it than me. And, and the second thing is that I, um, 
I mentioned, I, I, I had Ethel Butler was my first teacher, and she came out of the Graham Company, and she, she had us improvising and stuff. And then I went to uh, Milwaukee, where I grew up the rest of my growing up, and I had a teacher who uh, had studied with Ruth Page Ballet and also Graham, and so she gave us a mix. But I really wanted to be a classical dancer. I mean, that was my goal. I actually got to perform for President Kennedy as a ballerina when I was 14, and that was pretty interesting. But... Um, but in the end, I wasn't well served by my classical training. I know there's an old saw, you know, if you get that classical training, then you can do anything. I'm sorry, everybody, it's not true. <laughs> you get a classical training, you can do classical. And, um, but you, there are at least half the world's dances I cannot do. I'm up here and those dances are down. I've got a straight spine, I can't move my pelvis, I'm sorry. That's what, you know, Jow, you, meant, you heard Jowley, Jowley is teasing me all the time about my white pelvis, <laughs> the fact that I can't move it. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but what's interesting to me was how, if I'm gonna go in the studio and make up stuff, um, how could I break this is the first thing my body was gonna do. And so began a whole series of what I would call improvisational structures that gave people experiences, including me. And that's where I think I'm good. I can give, I can turn an idea, a research project, a notion, a question into an experiential thing to try in your body like that. And that's, that's been the gift, I think, that I have. And in this conversation about colonization and decolonization, I would like to acknowledge that I think I was trying to decolonize my body. And that, there, again, there's something in the nature of what it had taken. Uh, it didn't happen overnight. I'm still doing it, and I'm, you know, 55 years in, 60, well, actually, to be clear, 70 years in. Um, so all that helps the collaboration. We get into a lot of trouble with a collaboration. It is not easy. And one of the reasons it isn't is because we're not collaborating every second. Like right now, we're all having a nice talk in a minute. I could start, I don't know. I could make you all stand on a line or something, which I do in the, in the studio. It's like, we're all great, we're improvising. And all of a sudden, oh, I'd like, hey, stop. We're gonna do that, go. And now they have to stop improvising. They have to stop. Oh, I'm in my, my wonderful space here. And listen to me tell them what to do. So this is where I feel like our capacity to understand what's going on in our creative processes and name it as we go helps get through some of the hard times. So the question is, is specifically about, in the piece, there is a character in all white, and she remains in white throughout the piece. Um, and, and what is the potential significance of that? Can I ask how many of you might be coming tonight? Oh, OK, I can't answer the question. Uh, <laughs> but but, but I, I do think what's, what's significant about the question is that we all seek meaning. I mean. That's one of the great things human beings do, is try to create meaning. And I feel as a choreographer, if I put enough clues out, then you have lots of ways to create the meaning that you, that you but I can't, it, I can't not give you things to reflect on. I can't like leave a blank campus and, a canvas and think, oh, you'll do it. You won't. You need this thought. Why is she in white? And what could that mean to me? And what could it mean overall, and who, or who else is in white, and all of that. Um, I'd love to talk to you more about it, but I, I really think I, I, it, it, you're actually asking a question that is part of uh, a question I still have about the piece. So I'm still working through some things as well. Is how clear to make uh, certain parts of it. So we, the piece I did before this is called Healing Wars and it toured um, in dance venues, but it also spent two months at Arena Stage and at La Jolla Playhouse. So it got to play in, in the regional theater market, which I loved. And the director at La Jolla came and saw the piece. We brought it there for our last month. And he said, Liz, you gotta clarify the ending. I said, you're kidding me, it's so clear. Because <laughs> for dance, it was really clear. But for theater, no, not clear. So we had a long talk about it, and he got me to clarify. It was a question as whether this was about a character who's a spirit, and her job was to help soldiers cross over if they died in the battlefield. And in our piece, she was tired. She wasn't going to do it anymore. And so the question at the end of the piece, has she gotten herself back into a connection with, um, with that, and should she do that? And he did help me make it better. He did. 
and it still left some some possibility for you to to choose, but you did have to engage yourself in the question. Is she, what, is she, is she going to go back and do that? And it wasn't, again, oh, she's going to the grocery store. Oh, she's going to go. And it wasn't like that. So the, I, I hope there are enough clues, but it's a great question. I, I'm, I'm going to tell Paloma you asked it. <laughs> she's trying. We're, we're working on it. <laughs> the question was about uh, how Liz is engaging with her students at ASU, um, and particularly in, in terms of dance curriculum and, and what, what lies beyond modern dance. So first, um, first, I love that you said what you just said. I grew up in a modernist household. And my mother's dream was, for me, go to Bennington, be a modern dance, you know, all that. And I love that. So I'm going to have to do something which, I love, those of you who know me have seen me do this a million times, but there are worlds in which here's, say, for example, the work at the Kennedy Center, and here, down here, is my work in communities. This? This is formal, aesthetic, important work. Okay, you have to be in communities, okay. Or people do this. Oh, the community work matters. Give up, give up that stuff in the Kennedy Center. Okay, to me is so impoverished. Why would I want to choose one over the other? Why? So I do this. Right? It's here, which is an easy gesture, but hard to do, and even more so, if you make it a circle, you start seeing that there's all kinds of ways this works. So in establishing Afro-social Latin dance does not mean the end of modern dance. It only means that, well, most times that's what we do. Because that's, we live in a vertical world and most of us have experienced the world this way. Our universities are entirely built this way. Look at this, if it's like this, and you want to make a distinction between, well, I just put them together, Latin social and Afro-Latin, and you're in a vertical world, one of them has to be less than the other. So you get into trouble making any kind of distinctions, because you shame each other. But if you live in that world, you can make distinctions without rancor. And it's critical to make distinctions, you have to. So that's one thing. It's just like a philosophical framework to hold the way we hold change. But the second thing is what is our responsibility to be with the people that we are working with? And one of the, I was just talking about this today. Um, if you told me that your grandfather immigrated from Russia to the Ukraine in the early 1900s and moved, I mean, I probably know the story. I mean, I don't know the whole story. I know the story. I've heard it a million, I've lived it. My family, is, I know it. My student says to me, well, my parents came over in the 60s and they moved from Chicago, Mexico to Chicago and then they went, I don't know that story. So I think my school should have made me take a summer course like they do in Israel. When you move there, you, take, you go to an opan, you learn the language. They should have put me through six weeks of intense training so that I can understand, I can at least be, the second thing is, it's not, I have a beautiful friend, uh, Shumana Mandala, who's a classical Indian dancer, who's just amazing. And she says she doesn't like the term cultural competency. She uses the word cultural humility. Much better. We will never be competent in a culture that is not our own, but can we be, approach it with humility, curiosity, love even, desire, Yes. So th that's some of how I'm working through these things. And uh, yeah, I would say what Pam, who's sitting here, is doing here with the pillow and its history is spectacular. And if you aren't aware of this and want to know more about it, actually, we're in the right space for it. Um, but this ground is hallowed for so many reasons. And also, our founder, Ted Sean. Uh, and his, some of his compatriots, and Ruth St. Tennis too, although brilliant for their time in some ways, did some things that from our 21st century mind is unacceptable. So what are we gonna do? What do we do? And how do we talk about it? And how do we re, re -value, you know, live here with respect? Not deny, not deny every single thing. That, I mean, don't put it to shame. You know, don't, don't shame it, but look for what we can draw from it and how we can do better now. But if you are interested, Pam is there and, and beautiful and does amazing work around this. So, Pam Tadgy.
Yeah. There's also a book um, <laughs> about what was just talked about. It's called Hiking the Horizontal, written by Liz Lerman. <laughs> not, not unfortunately right here, but I bet it's in the bookstore. Um, thank you all so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Really nice to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Norton. 